Good afternoon. Actually, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Erica Brown Johnson, and I am here tonight with Loving Our Children, and we're speaking about our program AIM tonight. We have a guest speaker here tonight, Miss Anita Marie Whitby Davis. Um, I'm going to introduce Miss Davis tonight. She is a long-term friend. I've known her for many, many years. Um, Anita is the owner and operator of VIP Platinum Beauty, where she is the uh, board certified esthetician. She's also a licensed health and wellness therapist, a certified life and lifestyle coach, a business education and development consultant, as well as the CEO of Blautism, which is a nonprofit organization out of Tallahassee, Florida. Um, Ms. Cynthia Campbell is actually gonna open us up in prayer. And then we're going to introduce our questions for our guest speaker tonight. Hello, everybody, here we go. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you right now, Lord, for this opportunity to just come, Father God, to pour out, Father God, wisdom and knowledge from our speaker tonight. I thank you, Father God, that you have already ordained this time, Father God, and those that come on, they will be blessed and empowered, Father. I, I just cover everyone with the blood of Jesus, Lord, and let their hearts be quieted so they can learn, Father God, glean from the wisdom that she will share with us tonight. And I also, Father, those that are missing tonight, Father, I ask that you cover them. And the airways, Father, the enemy has been trying to attack them all day, but we will communicate with excellency of spirit and we will go forth in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So we're actually going to talk about her nonprofit organization, which is Blotism. Anita, tell us what Blotism is. Blotism Education is um, a nonprofit organization that was birthed out of the experience of first navigating through the educational system as an African-American mother, but also as a mother who has a child that is on the spectrum. My husband and I have our middle son, Austin, who is now 17 years old, is on the spectrum. And when you navigate through this program, we all have experiences in the educational system where we don't see a lot of representation for our children. But even more so when you have services and alignments with um, special needs children, whether it be a neurological disorder, um, a mental health disorder that needs to be addressed. Um, I found a lot of times our parents were not, they felt frightened and intimidated in the process. So not coming from a background of education, I was kind of birthed into one. My grandmother, 40 years in education. My mother, 40 years in education. The other aunt, that was her line of specialization. Another aunt, an occupational therapist. So all of them helped cultivate it. It was our village, right? But even with that village, we found roadblocks. Their expertise were not always met with the same level of um, acceptance with a, at a table with peers that did not even have twice as much or in near the um, and, and blah, blah, near enough ex experience that they had. So my solution to that was to say, if I have this blessing to have all of these people surrounding us help us cultivate it, but I see my counterparts that do not. What do we need to do to empower them? And in my family, I come from a family of uh, not just prayer filled women, but faith walking women. So when much is given, much is required, you are then responsible for utilizing those tests and challenges that you may come across to help others. So when uh, my mother, I can remember the first IEP meeting I ever attended alone, because my mother was always with us, um, was two days before my mother passed away. And I sat there and I remember the, the pebbles she dropped along the way. 
fortunately, my aunt was on the phone from, she's a consultant, she out of Atlanta. So she was listening because my mother always taught me never go into a meeting alone if you're the only one sitting on your side of the table. Mm. So fortunately, I was able to advocate for him. But in her memory is where Blantism education was birthed out of because all of the work that she had put poured into her children, her grandchildren, was not going to be in vain. So now I know the responsibility. I know what is required of me as her daughter mm -hmm. and as her grandchildren is to now serve my community because if I have it, I need to share it. Knowledge is, you know, my people perish for a lack of knowledge and it's not fair that if we have the knowledge, we are not sharing it with our counterparts. So, so yes, the, the term blotism, what is that? What does that come from? Because that's a term that was made up along the way. It I'm was. Assuming. It was. My aunt, which is Austin, has always been Austin's occupational therapist. She's been an occupational therapist now for almost 30 years. And um, as we were going through different names for the nonprofit, and it was, she just called me one day. She said, it blotism. And she said, black autism. And I said, kind of like blackish. And she was like, yes. And I said, okay. And that's where we went from. I, I, I walked close with my elders and my family, my aunts and uh, all of them became like mothers to me when I lost my mom. So, yeah. You have to, you have to. So, yeah. so we're, we're speaking today on autism in the black community or even having a special needs child Correct. In, in, in the black and minority communities. Mm -hmm. So my next question for you, Anita, being a mother of a child that has autism, what would you say has been your toughest hurdle in raising a child with autism? I think the toughest thing is, it's a twofold to this situation. For a long time, I didn't understand why my mother uh, focused on one area of his autistic gifting. Cause he's a very, he's intellectually, he could program and code and do all of those extensive, you know, projects, but he couldn't tie his shoe. So I would always wonder why, you know, and she said, because in our community, African-American people normally protect those children in their communities that have um, special needs for whatever reason, because we don't want them labeled in the mainstream um, school system. We want to focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses, and we protect them in that way. So the greatest challenge was making certain that I had the knowledge, the information. Now, my mom could write an IEP in her sleep, but I had to listen and soak up. I had to stay abreast of the latest um, information as it related to his care, the advances, because it moves very quickly. Autism in the last uh, 20, 30 years became a little unknown characteristic of children Right, I, an entire movement, but I had to listen and soak up. I had to stay abreast of the latest um, information as it related to his care, the advances, because it moves very quickly. Autism in the last uh, 20, 30 years became a little unknown. Character. That is Zoom for you. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But that's fine. We'll rock with it. Um, and so, I had to read the rest of the um, information as it related to his care, the advances, because it moves very quickly. Autism in the last uh, 20, 30 years became a little unknown. Character. That is Zoom for you. There you go. There you go. But that's fine. We'll rock with it. Um, and so I had to Read. Is it steady doing it over and over? Is yeah. that what it is doing? Yeah, hold on one second. The advances because it moves very quickly. Autism in the last. Um, is that just on your computer, Cynthia? A little unknown. This is not on mine. It's not on mine. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. 
But what I found is um, even in our community, because a lot of times we don't understand the process. Education had, I'm an educational advocate as well. So education has changed over the years. It's become big business. And our children are a product of that business. It political and everything. So trying to navigate all of the, the therapies that were necessary, knowing what resources that we had out there, making sure that all of his teachers were aware of his giftedness and things of that nature and that they handled him appropriately. I literally have an email chain that has been going on since 2017 to the current date of just correspondence going back and forth because I put everything in writing, everything. There's no verbal. And even if we have a phone conversation following it up. So it's on two platforms. I have to deal in my community, which his, his autism is often misunderstood because it's sometimes cliche. It's not, not a cliche, it's, it's taboo in our communities oftentimes, right? We don't wanna talk about that, whether it be mental illness, um, everybody kind of falls under one umbrella and people have this term in our community, oh, well, they're just retarded. They just slow. And not really understanding the nuances, mm -hmm. right? But then on the other side, we leave our children vulnerable when they're in an educational community that is well aware. And if we don't know what to ask for, we don't know what the rights are. We don't understand what we're supposed to, what we're, what we're entitled to for our children. Then they miss out, they're labeled. The same child that may be autistic is then found to be disruptive in the class. And then they want to place them in an EH class. There's a misdiagnosis. They don't do any testing because the parents really don't know what to ask for. And so you're working between two communities, your own, who doesn't quite understand um, what it is going on with your child or where on the spectrum they fit. Because a lot of them see autism as oh, he, you know, if I need to make a bet, I can ask him and he'll figure it out real quick like Rain Man. It, but, <laughs> and the spectrum is so broad. So you find yourself maneuvering to, through two um, communities. But ours, I feel a responsibility to my people, especially because I want them to understand that a lot of our babies are being misdiagnosed and lost in the process. And I find a lot of parents that are very wounded and just don't know what to do. Um, I help them continuously in the school that I am working in now, just maneuver through to find out. They don't want that label because they're afraid of it not realizing that early intervention is the best recourse. My mother began working with Austin at 18 months old because that was her line of specialization. And I realized had she not, then we just like anyone else could have been affected by it. So it's been, that's been the greatest challenge is maneuvering through both of those. Okay, got a few questions. Actually, Kashmir had some questions for you as well that she sent me. Oh. Okay. And one of them is um, kind of along the lines where you were speaking of, it says, uh, why do you believe black children are less likely to be diagnosed with autism? A lot of times, for instance, um, as I had shared with you coming through COVID, right? And I had the virus. I find that in our community, medically, we don't necessarily, we're not seen in the medical community, right? So when our children go into not necessarily a assigned physician or pediatrician at a young age, right? They can tap into that and kind of see it early. They kind of go to the health department in general, 
or they may not have a specialist that recognize some of these traits. So no one tells these parents, they just tell them, oh, he'll grow out of it. It'll be okay. And if you're going into a public health process, they're likely not to be seen by the same person over and over again, and they're just in and out for some shots. Well, for our children, they always went, we had a very old school pediatrician, first of all. And every year they have their physical, even as young men now, they have a physical that does their blood work, their eyes checked. But a lot of our families, which is that next phase of when they talk about universal health care, if they don't have the health care, to see a doctor or pay insurance is expensive for families, right? So they're not trying to do that. And when you tell a parent that they may have to pay out of pocket $600 for a diagnosis to see if, it, and they're not sure that they're necessarily autistic, right? That's not gonna happen. Or to find specialists that may take certain insurances because certain insurances don't pay for the testing. It just so happened that my husband and I have always had excellent insurance, right? So all of those things happen and because they don't have that, then that we miss out on those resources. Now I'm not telling you that they're not resources that are out there that they can um, receive those services, but because there's no one at the table sitting at the table that looks like us, it doesn't get to our community. It's because not explained to us. Yeah, it, it just doesn't get to our people on how to, because trust me, every family and other ethnicities are not paying $600 to get those tests done. But that's because they share information and resources on how to begin that early intervention at 18 months old, three years old. So their children are already ahead in that sense before they even reach the school age. Yeah, I would like to say something on that one because um, our neighborhood, um, I think just on our block, probably 60% of the children are diagnosed with autism. So the school is set up, um, people move here intentionally because they have some of the best um, resources and um, teachers and um, different people in place to help the children thrive. And many of them, I've seen them grown from, you know, not being able to handle their children where the children are out playing with others and everything else. And it's like, so what you're saying is really true. And um, we have three or four different autism um, centers here, but when you go in there, you don't hardly see any people of color. That's it. Yeah, that's it. And where are you in New Jersey? Colorado. Colorado. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. And there are actually families that will pick up and move if they have the resources to those centers. I know there, Colorado is one, New Jersey is one, um, Maryland is one where they have a hub and parents move there so that they can receive the best services possible for their children. But that should not be the case. It should be universal. But for the most part, when I walk into areas and arenas, there are not people who look like me. They're not mothers and fathers that look like me. I've walked in rooms to just have these discussions and been asked, well, um, is his father active in his life? Yeah, that's my husband. Yeah, he's there. And I'm not offended by it, but when they have not engaged people of color that travel that road, there's a natural assumption or, or a uh, misconception that we're traveling this road alone, right? And how that affects the child as well. So it's interesting. It's interesting. Kashmir, did you want to jump in? You're still muted. There you go. <laughs> oh, good to meet you. Sorry, I was a little late coming in. Um, not sure if you covered this already, but how important is it for parents with children of autism 
to be surrounded by other parents dealing with the same um, type of challenges? Is there like a support group that you have or that you know other parents um, go to or those type of resources? Well, here where I am, um, it's kind of, my husband comes from extended family and my mother's, I grew up overseas, but my mother's extended family is here. So for us, because um, many of them were educators and we had an extended family that understood who Austin was and understood it, that is very important to have a support system. And it may not necessarily be other parents with children that are on the spectrum, but I have a, a cousin whose son, uh, Dre just turned 30. So she was the first one in our family to have a child on the spectrum and he's nonverbal. Um, with Austin, so it's a, it's a big family, right? So to have a child that's on the spectrum is not unusual for us. So it's kind of like our family makes it, but I do believe it is important that parents that do have children on the spectrum come in contact with other parents and families and have a support system, even if it's not with other autistic parents with autistic children, right. but have a support system is very necessary. Like you, there is not a way to galvanize all the information coming to you, the lessons, or even just having a place where you can say, I'm confused and I don't know what's going on. I don't attend any meetings alone. I don't, um, his most recent meeting was last Friday and both of my aunts, the one in Atlanta and my other aunt, she was in, actually in South Florida. She had to call in. She lives here in Tallahassee, but they call in so that you have more ears. It's very important because if not, you can easily miss something or you can easily, someone can misconstrue and try to guide you down a path mm. saying, oh no, this is what's best for your child. But you know your child, yep. you're, you're familiar with your child. Um, so I think a lot of times they're discounted as parents, right? And you need that support system to tell you, no, mm -mm, they don't get to tell you everything about your child. You're entitled to yeah. speak what you believe is important. So a support system, definitely. Uh, thank you. I have another question. Um, you mentioned resources, like lack of resources. What would you say to parents who aren't sure how to get those resources or um, like medical attention, um, maybe financial help uh, for that medical attention or any programs? What can they do? What can they search for to get that? Well, that's kind of what Blontism was designed for. It's a, it's a space and place where we're building those resources because mm -hmm. the resources, whether financial or information vary by state, just as Ms. Campbell was saying, it varies by state because in Colorado, they're very pro-autism. They're, they're galvanized those resources because they have a lot of strength and backing from their local and state government, right? But you're not gonna find that in say Louisiana or Mississippi, right? So it's important that we create these platforms for which autism was designed for so that they join and say, what are we looking for? And I tell people all the time, and I, I use this as a philosophy on how I've always led myself even professionally. I'm not gonna claim to know everything, but I don't mind doing the research, research and supporting you to find the correct information for your area. I'm not an expert on everything, but unless we collectively come together, um, one of my moderators on our platform, um, I grew up with her in the Philippines and Mar has an autistic son. They live in California. There are a lot of prevalent things that they're doing out there that now I'm trying to bring here to Florida, even to take them to our capital so that next year when session is in place, we're creating a bill that address law enforcement, making sure they know of homes where children with autism that are on the spectrum or have neurological delays are in that or attached to that address. Because if they can update their system to say a judge lives here or a celebrity lives here, they can do likewise, right? Um, this year, I sit as president of Dre's Haven, 
It's a nonprofit for autistic children. Um, they are doing, because Dre is now 30, that's my cousin, um, they're creating transitional housing because they realize they're not gonna live here forever, right? So who's gonna take care of our children? So they're building a community down in the Orlando area that will allow um, adults with autism to transition over if something does happen to their families. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Some uh, more examples of the resources that- I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, so um, give me some examples of the resources that you would provide to a parent that has a child that's newly diagnosed with autism or any type of mental health issue. Okay. okay. The first thing I would do is say, let's sit down. It's overwhelming. Tell me how you feel. Just tell me how you feel. Because there's a lot of stigma that goes along with everything. And caretakers are often overlooked because they're trying to run this race to get on it. So tell me how you feel. Okay. Most of the time, those parents are either embarrassed. Yes. For what reason? I don't know. So they're embarrassed. They are uh, ashamed of their child. Correct. You find that. So there's a lot of shame and embarrassment that comes along with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so, so go ahead. I'll let you go with your resources. Yes. So what we do is we then sit down and I need to find out exactly where they are. Tell me where you are. Do you have current health coverage? What is their educational? Where are they on, you know, in, are they pre-K? Are they in kindergarten? What happened as you went into the school system? Have they been tested? Have they officially been diagnosed? I have a family right now, young lady that I worked with this year. She's 12 years old, developing into a young lady. And when her mom began talking to me, and her mother was a nurse, a psych nurse, but it never had her daughter officially diagnosed because she was afraid of it. But what was happening, it was creating additional frustrations for the child because the teachers had no idea. So we assess where are you and what, do, what, what are you looking for? And if it's in a different state and we have someone in that state that is working with us in that, on our platform, we say, okay, let's look at it. Let's take a quick look and see what it is that you need insurance. Like I said, insurance coverage, um, income levels, because that can determine whether or not their child can go in um, and receive social security benefits because it is an income barrier. If parents make too much money, it's not a lot of money, but if they're over a certain asset level, they do not qualify for SSI. So then with that comes coverage that allows for mental health treatment, that allows for you to go in. And some insurances have limitations. So I walk with them through to see what their information includes. Because a lot of people don't like getting into the weeds of it. Then if say, for instance, they're going into an IEP meeting and they're asking, cause they can ask the district to test their children. A lot of them don't know that. It may take a while, but they have the right to ask because why our, excuse me, our uh, schools receive federal funding for our children. So if you feel like your child may be having certain issues or reflections that demonstrate autism, you have the right to ask for testing. So we look at all of that. And then I tell them uh, most- I interrupt you, I just want you to go back and tell them what IEP is. I know what it is, but- Oh, okay. I apologize, you're right. Yes, it's, it's always in the language of the culture. An IEP is an individual educational plan. It addresses certain nuances or supports that a child and accommodations that a child may need to support them in an educational setting. You also have what is called a 504. And with the 504, and this is what I <laughs> get into a challenge with, with some, 
because the 504 does address accommodations, but a lot of educational systems like to lean on the 504 because it's less accountability and they have far less work. The IEP is a federal program that requires them, legally binds them and holds them to specific guidelines. And if they don't fulfill them, even the individual teachers are liable to that child. So a lot of times they like to push parents whose children are on the spectrum towards a 504 to make accommodations for them in the classroom versus utilizing, because now mind you, they get amazing funding, amazing money for each one of our children that they don't utilize. And you can ask just how much money you're receiving. You can, you are entitled to that information. But a lot of times we don't have the information because we don't know the right questions to ask. Right. So that's what, yeah. And all of the, all of that information mm -hmm. is what we do. Okay. And would you help? I, I know I'm just jumping in when I want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you go about disputing an IEP? I was on a call yesterday with um, the Colorado for Kids Network and we were talking about these things yesterday. Okay. So it's just, um, you know, disputing the IEP also, uh, you know, some of the parents are like, well, we can't do anything about it. The teacher is like, no, mm -hmm. you have the power and you need to take, take, um, take the responsibility. So would you also help um, parents walk through those, um, those challenges when teachers Absolutely. or um, others that, um, that are caretakers are pushing against what the individual plan is supposed to be for them, their child? Absolutely, because what I, and I have walked through it myself, Mm -hmm. um, because what happens is they always like to make parents feel as if they know best for their child. Mm -hmm. When the truth of the matter is an IEP and those accommodations, the parent is the decision maker. They are just the facilitator. So the first thing I tell my parents and my caretakers, everything is in writing. Mm -hmm. When they tell you something, you follow it up with an email per our conversation. So I am clear. This is what you suggested. And this is what you said. And I was not comfortable, nor do I, nor am I in favor of. It's amazing that when things go into writing, how quickly the tables turn. Yes. Yes. Very quickly. Because then there is a paper trail of accountability. And I don't know how well the teachers union is in Colorado, but I know in most states, they will tell you, we're not going to stand up for you when you put yourself at fault for not listening actively to this parent. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. They push back and parents feel overwhelmed because you're already taking care of your children. You're already doing the day to day that you have to you shouldn't feel as if you're going into a battleground with people just to receive care. And I can say this, in that first IEP meeting that I attended on my own, and normally my mother just handled everything and I signed because I knew she knew what to do. But in that, that first meeting I had to attend, which was our son's ninth grade year, I had eight individuals sitting around the table, one being an administrator, another one from the district. And when they made their suggestions very arrogantly and she came over with the form and she said, well, Ms. Davis, I need you to sign here. I said, didn't I just tell you I don't agree with it? I'm not signing anything. And it took them aback. They just didn't know what, because you have the right to refuse and then you have the right to follow it up and you have the right to tell them what you want for your child because those are your tax dollars and you have the right to tell them. They can't tell you what they think. That is disrespectful. It's, it's just disrespectful. So yes, I do, because I feel very passionately about that part. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is probably one of my last questions. Um, being that mental health is so taboo in the minority communities, mm -hmm. what advice would you give our community regarding mental health assistance? Um, I think all of us have experienced that 
mm-hmm. being African American women, mm-hmm. and we've experienced some form of mental illness within our own families. Okay. Everyone has, mm-hmm. no matter how much you want to deny it, it's there. Mm-hmm. And m- most of it, growing up, we didn't talk about it. Mm-mm. We didn't address it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I can honestly say, especially those who were older than me, they didn't get the help that they needed. Correct. So, what what advice? would you give the black community or minority community? Ironically, um, today I was watching a clip from Taraji Henson and um, she talked about how in our communities, they've always, especially with black women, we're just strong. We're just strong. We're not supposed to feel vulnerable we're not supposed to feel as if we can't handle it. And this is generational. We've never had an opportunity through all of history, historically since we've landed on this continent to literally decompress and say, you know what? I'm tired, whether it was through Jim Crow, whether it was through slavery and it's just compounded. So they were told that we were always told that we were supposed to pray it away. But I embrace my sisters and I tell them, you deserve the same God that you pray to loves his daughter. Mm -hmm. And he did not intend for you to suffer. You don't have to be strong about everything and carry all of that weight. And if you don't have but one person that you know, for instance, with me, I dealt with anxiety. I dealt with depression after my mother died, being an only child. It just, I did not know that I wanted to be here, but I was at a place in my walk with God where I knew if I said it, it wasn't a failure to my faith. Yes. And we have to be at a place where we love one another. Being here with you women tonight, you ladies tonight is is one of those steps where we're embracing each other, where we just love on each other. Because everyone thinks that a black woman is supposed to carry everything. We had grandmothers, I know my grandmother died, sat in a chair in her house and died, never been in the, doctor before of a heart attack and when my mother and I unpacked that baggage a lot of it had to do with her caring so much for other people pouring out that you begin giving from an empty well and we've got to forgive each other enough to say yeah I have my strength but I don't have to carry that and we have to learn to look at our sisters and just hug them I love you. You don't have to be strong. If you want to cry, I tell my girlfriends, I don't care if it's the middle of the night, if you just want to call and cry on the phone with me, just cry. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And then as you walk through and you find yourself going in other places, if you need to see a mental health specialist, do that. It's no different than you caring about your hair, your nails, you going to the doctor to get a tooth fixed. You deserve it. You deserve somebody. And I don't think enough people, even in our own community, tell my sisters, they can pray the walls down in a church, but won't tell my sisters, you deserve to be loved on. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be taken care of, baby girl. You deserve to just be loved. You don't have to be hard. Today, I don't want you to do anything. And if you need someone to talk to, and the pastor can't do it. And, 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 and as much as you pray, God didn't make these people doctors and therapists and all of this without, for no reason. Uh, go see you somebody, baby. It's okay. It's all right. Because guess what? Just like your tooth needs fixed, sometimes something inside your spirit needs to be fixed. And you deserve it. And I think one, one of the biggest things is your girlfriend doesn't always have the tools to fix it. it your mama doesn't have that, the tools to fix it. Come on. Your, your barber doesn't have the tool to fix it. 
and you have to find the right resources to help direct you in the right direction. And we're constantly getting information from places that don't have the right information for us. Correct, correct, correct. And I now I will emphasize that I am a proponent of a culturally competent therapist when it comes to black women. Because when we walk into certain spaces, unless people understand those words and that language that comes out of your mouth, those nuances that we speak in, those that, that way we roll our eyes and a sister can tell us, girl, now, come on, tell me the truth. To he- make you feel comfortable because you know she knows even if it's only the two of you in a boardroom and nobody else looks at you, you know when your sister across the room understands you whether words are spoken or not. I do believe cultural competency is very important in therapy though. I will say that. I wanna, I wanna piggyback on that because after I left the Middle East, the, um, it, was, it was trauma that happened there and they were like, oh, my job was like, you have to go see someone. And I was sitting there talking to the guy, you know, having it, cause I had to go. And so then um, in his, uh, he, the first thing he said, like after five minutes of me talking, he's like, oh, you're the first wo- woman I met. You're a black woman syndrome thing. And he was like all excited about it. I'm like, we're not here for that. You know, <laughs> I mean, you can't, I'm like, is that, you're gonna, that's what you're gonna say to your patient? Right. So, um, so I do agree with that. Cause it's like, how how you gonna, you supposed to be here helping me work through this issue. He's studying you, but he's studying you. You, studying you- me for, because he, I'm the, I'm something he read about and he finally got to see one. <laughs> see oh one. <laughs> So, and then I was counseling him and I'm like, okay, I gotta go find somebody else. Cause I, dude, you know, this is ridiculous. Exactly. So, so I, I um, just want to say a true fact on that one. And one other thing I want to say, um, lady, her name is, um, she, I'm just going to say her uh, first name starts with a T. She has, um, she wants us to pray with her, uh, pray for her before we end. Um, she has three kids on the spectrum and her husband left her because he didn't oh. want to deal with that. So. Mm-hmm. And we address all of those issues as well because she needs the support um, as we were talking about earlier, being surrounded by other family members or parents that have children on the spectrum. When you're left like that, that, you know, there's a... Could Could we get her location as well so we can... Anita can possibly provide her some resources yes, in her area. Can offline. Yes, yes, we can do that offline yes. and definitely send her over to the page, the yeah. Blautism uh, Facebook page. That way, if she wanted to message me privately, she could do that. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of our members don't post, but they receive the uh, resources that we put out there. Okay. So that they're able to read through it. And then that way, if they have questions. All right, they I'm going to text her right now. I'm trying to listen in and look at these people too. I'm like, oh, okay. So okay. yes, yes. Okay, sounds wonderful. Absolutely. Have any more questions from the live, Cynthia? I do. Um, one one couple said that um, they're actually here in Colorado. They said they had to separate, um, you know, separate and they got a divorce to raise their, so they could get the Financial. finances to help their child. Mm-hmm. And they're like, um, but now, now that they're walking in a Christian faith, they don't feel like, even though they were married before and they divorced for financial reasons to help their child, they, they're in that dilemma. So that's, that, that's so sad, but yeah. that's what I was saying about the universal health care. It's unfortunate that in our, in our society, they've now created um, a division against marriage. I'll just be perfectly honest. It, it, it provides them more if they're in a separated house, even though your child suffers too. Anything, and, I, and it goes against our faith walk, right? We're not wanting to do that. We're not wanting them to live like that. We wanna have our ordained lifestyle the way God intended. And we're living in a world which does not celebrate that. In fact, it does everything to cause that to be otherwise. So that's where 
before we pray, um, Cynthia, for that young lady, I just want to do a, re a recap of some things Anita said tonight. Um, one of the thing is uh, you named three states that have resources that you know that have larger platform for resources for um, children on the spectrum of autism. And that was Maryland, New Jersey, and Colorado. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you know of any other states that may have that, that just right off? They, are, of they are the top providers, I know. Now, a lot of other states have good base level movements happening. Like even here in Florida, we have some excellent resources. We really do, um, whether it's Florida State, the CARD, um, um, many of our universities here in the state of Florida have created um, programs for uh, autistic uh, children to attend the universities and they have programs that, that are just designed for them that are specifically geared to help them transition. Um, I don't know if I'm a proponent necessarily of sending my child off if they're on the spectrum um, to be on their own, especially as a freshman, it takes a lot for any child that's atypical to do that. So, but they are coming along, but it does require advocacy. In these states, if you do not start at the capital level where the dollars are being dispersed from the Department of Education, a lot of times that's where it comes. So it has to be grassroots work. But uh, Georgia, Florida, um, Oklahoma, um, Connecticut, um, let me think, I'm trying to go down, Washington State and Oregon. A lot of those states have those grassroots programs that are rising, but the first three that I name are the most successful ones. Mm -hmm. gotcha. <clears throat> um, the next thing is federal funding. You're, you stated that all schools have federal funding for IEP plans as well as 504 accommodations. And mm -hmm. as, a par as a parent, if you decide you want to fight the IEP, IEP plan, you have that choice. Am I correct? That is correct. And what you do is districts will often tell you, well, our district does this. Well, you have the right to find an advocate in your area to help you hold them accountable. But when you, any parent that wants to move forward with testing and so forth, please, whatever you do, put it in writing when you send for those requests. Don't verbally ask for anything, put it in writing. All right, the next one is um, insurance. Basically finding insurance that could, um, that you can actually possibly get your child tested. Is it necessary if the child is schooled age and the school provides the funding? Right. Is it, it is necessary, but what you find is a lot of times they go to the latter end. They're going to be working through the IEPs and 504s that they have, and testing takes sometimes the entire school year before they get around to testing your child. When you have a private insurance that will assist you with that testing, it makes all the difference to go ahead and get that out of the way. It really, really does. If you if you're able to do that, if you're able to do that, and, and you then, have, let me let me preface with this too. You do have some colleges and universities that you may check with in your local area that may have active programs where they do testing, conduct testings through their uh, educational or their psychology department, so they can check into those as well. And the last one is seeking culturally conscious counselors. Yeah. That's, 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 that was new to me. I, I didn't even think about it like that yeah. until uh, you stated it and Cynthia gave her explanation, but that's gonna be very important. Yeah. And that could be very well re the reason why a lot of people shy away from counseling it is. because they don't feel like basically for one, they're accepted or understood. 
Correct. when they go in for counseling. So I think that would be actually great, 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 great. great. Yes. All right, Cynthia, Kashmir, did you have any more questions? No, <laughs> no. Okay. Are you sure? You can always. <laughs> I, I do want to yeah, say. We're going to talk to you again, and um, we want to interview interview you for the Blended Magazine, and so more in depth. But I know we're we're trying to be um, mindful of the time, so we're gonna, I'm going to say no. Okay, no problem. You have my information. I just wanted to thank you, Miss Anita. Just listening to you speak, your love, your compassion, your knowledge. Like I could listen to you speak all day. <laughs> well, you thank you so like much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you awesome. all for having me, honestly. Thank Great. you. Great. All right, Cynthia, you want to go ahead and lead us in prayer for well, the young lady? I was have Miss Anita do it. That's who the lady oh, okay. Is. So, okay. Okay, absolutely. I would be honored right. to. Go right ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I'd like to come to you this evening and thank you for this opportunity for us to come collectively together. But Father, specifically, being specific in our prayer, I ask that you touch the life of that mother right now, Father God. Touch her heart so that healing through you can begin, Father. I was once told the gifting of children that are born with special needs are gifted to those equipped to handle the journey. Father God, wherever that father is and that husband is, I pray also that you reconcile him in whatever way that you need to, Father. But in the meantime, Jesus, I ask that you just cover that mother and her children, understanding that a mother's love has been said to be the closest to the love that you have for your children, Father. We know that you never put more on us than we can bear. But Father, we know that you have your people here also to help that we can support and give them practical information and knowledge that they need to travel this journey that oftentimes appears so overwhelming that we don't know why we're here. Father God, ministry is not simply giving a word or saying a prayer or just in the walls of the church building. Your people are the church, Father God. So the ministry is to be given to this mother and her children. Words of encouragement and love so that she can right now, even through teared eyes, I'm sure she has, Father God, looking at her children and wondering, what do I do next? That is the reality that she feels right now, Father. So it is up to us to give her and support her the resources so she can see her way through. Because Father God, your word is a living word that abides in each and every one of us. So we take that word and we bestow it unto your children so that we can help them, guide them, support them so that they can see their way through because nothing is too big for our God. But we are your disciples upon the earth that are supposed to and are required to help your children give them the practical skills, information, knowledge, and resources that they need. So Father, right now, I ask that you touch your heart. Bless that household, Father God. Bring about peace. Send your angels into that household, Father. Cover them, Lord God. Bring peace. And if there is something that we are able to do, Father God, we will seek you first and your guidance on how to do so. Father, I thank you for each household represented here tonight, Father, because you know that there's a work that we're doing upon this earth for your children, Father. Nothing is too big or too small. And nothing is certainly not too, any great, too great for you. So we ask that we just allow you to use us. Use us, Father, 
so that we can do your work. We thank you. And all of these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. All right. I want to thank you, ladies, for coming on tonight. It was a blessing. I got some information that I didn't know of. I just want to thank you, Anita, for taking the invitation and running with it. I really, really appreciate you tonight. And we will definitely keep you, your family, and Austin in our prayers. Thank you so much. Uh, All righty. All right. Good night. Good night, ladies. Take care. Bye-bye.